great to be here in Oslo. Thank you very much for having me. Um, it's always interesting when doing these kinds of talks and someone says, we've got some controversial speakers. I don't think this is controversial. You know, what is controversial about safe and efficacious treatments that get our patients better than the current lousy maintenance therapies we use? This is evidence-based science. There's nothing, there's no emotional messianic desire to bring psychedelics to the world. This is boring, data-driven science. It works, it's safe. The controversy, the lack of ethics, is that we're not doing it. That's what's really controversial. So, I'm a boring scientist, really. I used to be a DJ. <laughs> so, we, we have so much public health stuff thrown at us about diabetes and obesity and smoking and lung cancer, but this developmental trajectory is so often overlooked. And what have we got there? Okay, is that a scared, frightened, humiliated, bruised 10-year-old girl? No, that is a piece of scum. Public enemy number one. It's her fault. She did that. Now, she's no longer 10, she's 40 and she's sitting by the bus stop and she wants you to give her some money. Don't give her any money. She'll only spend it on alcohol or drugs. She could stop if she wanted to, she just doesn't want to. It's a lifestyle choice. Now that's outrageous, isn't it? It's disgusting. And it's, it's outrageous in two ways. Firstly, we have to be deeply compassionate towards all people, no matter how they behave or how they got there. It's the number one rule of us as humans. But secondly, in failing to recognize this developmental trajectory, we're failing to recognize a very important piece of science. The effect size between attachment, disruption, and later adult mental health, and particularly addictions, is one of the strongest effect, size, effect sizes in the whole of psychiatry. It's an absolute inevitability that if you hurt, humiliate, exclude a child, you're going to break them and they're going to struggle as an adult. So we absolutely need to know the science of this as well as the compassion. So, when we talk about child abuse, we often, people think of child abuse as sexual abuse and physical abuse. What I always say is don't take your eye off the ball when it comes to emotional abuse and neglect. Um, the big ones that hit the social services radar are all very well, but I've worked with so many children and young people and adults where, with, with profound psychological difficulties, and we've scoured their medical notes and their social service histories, assuming there must have been some physical or sexual abuse, and often there's not. It's this emotional abuse and neglect is profoundly damaging to, you, to the human psyche. I don't love you. Your dad doesn't love you either. We didn't want a boy, we wanted a girl. You're useless, you're a failure. You're a slut. You deserve to be exploited and raped. It's your fault. This drip, drip, drip emotional abuse during childhood has profound effects on the development of personality. So we have parenting issues and attachment problems. Um, Yes, child psychiatrists bang on about two things. One, attachment, two, boundaries. That's kind of pretty much all we talk about. It's not just the abuse factors like that. Those of you that work in mental health know that there's a whole host of psychosocial factors. We work in mental health with the people on the bottom rung of the ladder. We work with the unemployed, the racially excluded, the people in transgenerational poverty, transgenerational unemployment, lack of hope. And so it's multiple risk factors that come together, plus genetics as well. And the thing about genetics is the lousy genes hang around in the lousy environments. They're not equally spread. So all the nice posh kids at the posh schools with the great parents and the great education and the great jobs, they've all got the good genes. And all the people with the genes for depression and personality disorders and addictions and psychosis, they cluster in the poor part of town with all of those difficult psychosocial factors. So it's a multiple level of risk factors that add up to produce the end phenotype, which does sound pretty desperate and hopeless, but actually for me, what that says is look at all the positive therapeutic opportunities to intervene. So now bringing up children is pretty easy in many ways, and there's a wide spectrum. You've got to love them, you've got to kiss them, you've got to cuddle them, you've got to play with them, you've got to tell them they're funny and attractive and beautiful and they're going to do good things. Now, if you don't do that, if, as a child, you're brought up in an environment where you don't know from one minute to the next, when your caregiver comes into the room, are they going to give you a kiss and a cuddle, sit down on the floor and do a jigsaw with you, or are they going to punch you or kick you or burn you with a cigarette, or are they going to rape you? 
Now, when you grow up in that environment, you develop physical brain changes that are neuroadaptive to allow you to cope. So this is a bit of a physiological um, exercise here. The area in red is the amygdala. Now, the amygdala is a very ancient part of the brain. Um, it's in what we call the mammalian brain. It's a part of the brain that has no top-down influence. It has bottom-up influence only. It's a part of the brain that fires in response to stress and fear. So if someone comes onto the stage now with a knife, my amygdala will fire. I'm in danger, you've got to get out. And it triggers a hormonal response called fight, flight, freeze. It's a neuroadaptive survival technique, keeps us alive. The green area is prefrontal cortex, much more sophisticated part of the brain. Part of the brain where you, it's very human. Only humans and some of the higher primates have a reasonably sized prefrontal cortex. It's where we use all human characteristics, logic, reasoning, judgment, and we can overcome that instinctive amygdala response. So the guy comes into the, onto the stage with the knife, my amygdala says, you're in danger, get out. Fraction of a second later, prefrontal cortex kicks in, well, he looks kind of reasonable, he's probably okay, he's wearing a chef's hat, you know. So there's this constant debate between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. Now, if you're a child that's grown up in an environment where you're constantly exposed to fear, constantly exposed to stress. You develop an exaggerated amygdala response. You have physical, hardwired changes in the brain during infancy and early development in which you find things more scary than others. Good job too, because you'll be dead if not. If every time your caregiver comes into the room, you walk up to them with open arms, you learn that's not going to keep you alive. And they come into the room and you hide behind the sofa. So this is a positive neuroadaptive response. Indeed, in some many ways, all of the symptoms of PTSD are a sign of a healthy brain. It's a brain trying to survive in a noxious environment. Now, when you grow up in this environment, constantly exposed to fear, what happens is you create narratives about yourself and the world. I am a bad person. I am dangerous. I am unlovable. I am hated. No one will ever love me. I can't achieve. I'm worthless. And narratives about the world. People are dangerous. No, don't trust anyone. Everyone's out to get you. If someone's being kind and loving towards you, they're probably going to hurt you, so don't trust them. And these narratives become extremely fixed. Very rigid. I wouldn't say they are totally inflexible, or we would be out of a job as clinicians, but they're very hard to shift. And sometimes I have my patients in front of them, and I just want to shake them and just say, look, man, it's very arrogant of me to say this about you, but you're just wrong about yourself. You are not a useless, worthless piece of crap. You are not unlovable. You're a perfectly reasonable person. I'm really sorry that you were told that when you were that high, and you now still believe it when you're 40, but you're wrong. And the world is not a dangerous place. Almost everyone everywhere is lovely. It's true. Most people are incredibly benign. We look after each other. We're charitable. That's how society works. But when you've been taught these lessons from the earliest age, you believe it. In many ways, the attachment relationship is a design fault in the human brain. It goes with the assumption that your primary caregiver is going to do the right thing. And this modeling effect that they teach you about the world and you believe it, that sort of assumes you're going to have a good experience of attachment. If you have a lousy experience, you believe it and you go into life with it. And it's so overwhelming to believe that about oneself and the world that by far the easiest thing to do is to just numb the edges. All of my patients who are alcoholic, opiate dependent, cocaine dependent, all they want is a quiet brain. I can't blame them. I'd do the same. I don't want to be in pain. They just want pain-free life. And you can't blame them for that. Now, it's really hard to treat trauma when it emerges from this experience of childhood because it becomes so rigid. There is no single drug that treats it. We have polypharmacy, and we treat it symptomatically. If they're depressed, give them an antidepressant. If they can't sleep, give them a hypnotic. If their mood goes up and down, give them a mood stabilizer. If their hypervigilance, their edginess turns into paranoia, give them an antipsychotic. None of these compounds treat the cause. None of them treat the trauma. They just paper over the symptoms as they arise. A good analogy would be um, 
If you have a fever due to an infection, so you have a microorganism, a bug, causing an infection, one of the symptoms is high temperature, a fever. You can take paracetamol, you can take ibuprofen. That will bring down your fever and make you feel a bit better. But paracetamol and ibuprofen are not antibiotics. They're not going to kill the bug that caused it, they're just going to treat the symptom. And when we load our patients with SSRIs and mood stabilizers and hypnotics, we're just treating the temperature on top of the infection. We're not treating the true cause. And we have a whole load of polypsychotherapies as well. And, you know, psychologists in the audience may argue with me on this, but 20 years in psychiatry, my experience is the most important thing about psychotherapy is the engagement and the relationship and the trust and the bonding and the position in which to share your feelings. Now, that's all very well for people who can do that, but with these um, trauma-based disorders, even the very thought of talking about your rape is impossible. The moment they sit down with the therapist and the therapist says, tell me about your rape, they're out the door, back to the vodka. They just have this dissociative episode that means they can't engage. This is why we have a 50% treatment resistance with the PTSD. It's impossible to treat people with the drugs and with the psychotherapies. Now, just want to talk about this legal high. Um, I think you're pretty good in this country, but in the UK we are rubbish when it comes to alcohol. Everyone's drunk the whole time. It's a terrible situation. Um, there's far too much cheap alcohol. We just went to the pub earlier this afternoon. Nine quid for a beer. Um, good, that's how it should be, you know? Um, in the UK you can buy a beer for 49p. 49 pence. The same amount of water in a pub costs you 89 pence. What's going on? So we have way too much alcohol problems in the UK, and we're walking into this um, terrible situation. Now, how well are we doing to treat it? So, with the very best that modern medicine can throw at you, detox, anti-craving drugs, rehab, AA, MAP groups, individual psychotherapy, group psychotherapy, the very best we can throw at our patients, 80 to 90% are drinking again within three to four years. That is rubbish. That is crap. We were doing better at uh, treating alcoholism in the Victorian times than we are today. Now, I can't think of any other branch of medicine that would stand for those kinds of outcomes. Yet, for some reason, this, this maligned and excluded subject of addiction psychiatry are settling for this. So we, we had a look at the treatment outcomes in Bristol where I work. We took people, we screened them before detox, we detoxed them, we then put them through whatever their normal treatments were, we followed them up at three, six, and nine months. No intervention, observational study, and at the end of the nine months, eight out of 11 are drinking again. Pretty typical, what we expect. Now, we've had 100 years of modern psychiatry, and this is not good enough. Yeah? We have become learned helpless in psychiatry. Psychiatry is a miserable place to work if it wasn't for the wonderful patients. It feels like a palliative care industry. We, we get alongside our patients for life. Because if you're a psychiatric patient turning up with a severe anxiety-based disorder or addiction disorder or PTSD in your 20s due to severe child abuse, there is a very high chance you will still be talking to your psychiatrist in your 60s. That is not good enough. We've given up the concept of cure. We don't think we can cure people. We think we can just look after them. We can cure people. We can get them in, we can get them better, and we can get them out, just like the orthopedic surgeons do. Why shouldn't we be thinking that way? Where is our antibiotic that kills the bug? And you can see where this is going. So three, four... <laughs> three, four methylene dioxymethamphetamine is a quite remarkable molecule, and we could do with looking at this in a bit more detail. Now, when it comes to addiction studies, um, most of the work done in the 50s and early 60s was with, with LSD, was with alcohol, and classic psychedelics like um, LSD and psilocybin, and let's consider ketamine in there as well, um, they, they, they have a very long history in treating addictions. 
um, both back in the 50s and 60s, and also the contemporary studies with psilocybin for treating cocaine addiction and alcohol addiction and nicotine addiction. But what's common about all of these classic psychedelic treatments of addiction is they all seem to work when they induced a mind-blowing, mystical, um, godlike peak experience. The more you had your mind blown and the more you spoke with God, the more likely you are to remain sober. Now, when we started this study, we know that MDMA doesn't classically produce a mystical experience. About 5 to 10% of first dose, threshold dose MDMA experiences will be reported as mystical. But that's nothing like the 80 to 90% that people will report with, M with LSD or psilocybin. So we thought, well, maybe it won't work. But we knew about all the work that was being done on PTSD and the effect on trauma. So we put two and two together, loads of trauma in addiction, MDMA works with trauma, let's see if it works for alcoholism. And that's what started the study. Now, if you were going to invent a drug to assist trauma-focused psychotherapy, you would come up with MDMA. It's short-acting, two to five hours. It's mildly psychedelic, but we're not talking dripping walls and melting faces. It's just enough to make you think outside the box and be slightly more original, look at old situations with new eyes. It's um, invariably pleasurable. That's a really important characteristic for a drug when, it, when you need it to be um, clinically applicable. Um, there are a few, few drugs in pharmacology that are so invariably pleasurable. The other group would be the opiates. When I'm teaching medical students, I say to them, if you don't like heroin, you don't have a brain. We are hardwired to have a pleasurable experience on some of these drugs. So MDMA is one of those drugs. It either works or it doesn't, but you don't really have a bad trip. And that's very important when it comes to clinical um, accessibility. It's safe, yeah? Well, I've been talking about MDMA for 15 years, and I used to put up loads of graphs of ecstasy users, whatever they are, and trying to justify the safety. I just don't bother. You can ask me about that afterwards if you're concerned. MDMA is a staggeringly safe drug. We have in the UK 750,000 doses of MDMA every weekend. Three quarters of a million doses taken every weekend for the last quarter of a century. 25 years of data. And the rates of morbidity or mortality are staggeringly low. Maybe five a year attributed solely to MDMA. Now, you can bet your life that all five of those deaths get on the front page of the tabloid newspapers, leaving this perception that it's dangerous. It simply is not that dangerous. We would know about it by now in drug services if it was. Um, but it's its ability to enhance empathy that makes it so useful clinically. Um, many ways to classify psychedelic drugs. We can classify them according to their structure, and most are based around the tryptamines or phenethylamines. And there's MDMA as a phenethylamine. Whoa. Um, it's, you, can, you, can base, you can classify according to their mode of action, and uh, MDMA fits into this group, the intactogens, alongside uh, MDA and the 2C series of drugs. Now, how does MDMA work? Well, it works across multiple receptors. So, at the 5-HT1A and 1B receptors, this is where you have the reduced depression, reduced anxiety, positively felt mood. It's very important for patients who've never had a positively felt mood. Patients who, since they were born, have not been known nothing but fear. And on the MDMA experience, I mean, patients will say to me, oh, wow, is this what love feels like? And I'll say, yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, I know, and the cynics would say, this is not real love. This is an artificial, drug-induced experience. Of course it is. But if you've never had that experience, if you've never felt that moment of peace and serenity and acceptance for yourself and empathy towards others, it's a hugely important clinical tool to be able to give a person that experience and use that as a platform on which to help them go forward. At the 5-HT2A receptors, which is where... Classic psychedelics, LSD and psilocybin work. Mild effect, but as I said, not too much, but just enough to keep you thinking. Then it's got this weird paradoxical effect. The amphetamine part of the molecule causes a stimulation effect, the dopamine-mediated effect. Paradoxically, at the same time, there's this relaxation effect by the, via the alpha-1 and 2 receptors. And any of you who've taken MDMA would be familiar with that experience of being both speeded up and slowed down at the same time. That puts you in this perfect optimal arousal zone for psychotherapy. Speeded up enough to engage in treatment, but slowed down enough to take the edge off that hypervigilance that goes with recall of painful memories. And then, of course, at the hypothalamus, it has this hormonal effect. 
secretion of oxytocin. Oxytocin is the hormone secreted from the brains of breastfeeding mothers. It engenders a sense of attachment and bonding. And here's that traumatized brain with its hardwired physical brain changes as a result of child abuse. MDMA reverses that. It shrinks the amygdala response. Things that you normally find scary and not so scary, and things that uh, and the prefrontal response is boosted. You have an opening of the heart, an opening of the acceptance of positivity. Now, when you add all these things up together, this is my favorite phrase for MDMA. It selectively inhibits the fear response whilst leaving the other faculties intact. Now, many other drugs inhibit the fear response. A bag of heroin will inhibit the fear response. A bottle of vodka will inhibit the fear response. But they're messy, dirty drugs. You can't work on those drugs. You can't talk. You can't remember. You can't debate. You can't reflect. You can't talk about your childhood. And you certainly wouldn't remember any of it the next day. And I asked my patients the next day after MDMA, do you remember what we talked about yesterday? Were you just high? And they say, yeah, I was high, but I remember it all. It was crystal clear. But the fear had gone, just the fear, not the other faculties. And I can share an anecdote with you, because I was young, um, age 18 in 1990, after a rave, um, before I went to medical school, lying around on MDMA, with my friends and saying, oh man, this is so beautiful, we're all so loved up. And somebody said, oh man, try and think of the worst thing in the world. So we all lay there and we went, oh, let's imagine our mums dying. And we all lay there and went, it's not that bad. <laughs> and this is before I knew anything about MDMA psychotherapy, but that's kind of what we're doing. We're taking out the fear thing. We're taking out that that part of your brain that you would normally avoid going to, and you're doing psychotherapy. So imagine you've got a patient who is in their 40s or 50s and they're alcohol dependent, and they have done absolutely everything in their life, everything to not think about that night when they were eight years old and their grandfather came into their bedroom. They've become alcoholic, they've become a heroin user, they've self-harmed, they've attempted suicide. Everything has been around never going there to that memory ever again. And on MDMA, they find they can. So we're doing an open, we've almost finished an open label study. This is open label. There are no control groups. There is no placebo, which might make you think that sounds like not very good scientific methodology. But that's what you have to do when you use a new drug in a new condition. This is a safety and tolerability study. And we take patients, just like the previous observational study we did, detox them, then they come into an eight-week session of MDMA psychotherapy, and then we follow them up at three, six, and nine months. So we've slotted this therapy in. And typical with most psychedelic therapies, um, there's a, most of the sessions are non-drug, face-to-face um, psychotherapy sessions. On two occasions, in weeks three and six, they take MDMA. And they take 125 milligrams, two hours later, another 62.5. So they take 187.5 milligrams of MDMA twice, interspersed with non-drug sessions. Um, so I've already mentioned this. We cannot make inferences about clinical MDMA by looking at ecstasy users. What even are ecstasy users? It's whatever somebody says it is. So, we have to focus on the science. And it's very frustrating when I'm doing interviews or for media and stuff, and people talk about the risks of MDMA therapy based on someone dying in a nightclub having taken 15 ecstasy pills. What does that have to do with what we're doing? Nothing. So we have to focus on clinical MDMA and the applications in which we use it. Um, this is David Nutt's Delphic analysis of the most dangerous 20 drugs. And as you can see, the psychedelics languishing down at the bottom there. Um, and this is the Misuse of Drugs, Drugs Act, the most ridiculous, unethical, unpleasable, immoral, unscientific piece of rubbish that's ever come out of the last 50 years of legislation. We have, this, we have this arbitrary collection of drugs into class A, B, and C, which bears little or no relevance to the actual pharmacology risks or benefits of the drugs. It's pathetic. So a few, a few pictures of where we're going with our study. That was 
about three, I was much older then. That was about three years ago when we started. Um, some qualitative statements of, of the changes. Because it's, a, it's not an efficacy study, it's a, a safety and tolerability study, we're really interested in the qualitative reports of what people are saying and how this compares to previous treatments. Um, it's very well tolerated. Um, people like doing it. And, they, and again and again, what we're hearing is we, we keep hearing much, much unexpected results that they are having mystical peak experiences. People are not just concentrating on in, index trauma. Again and again, we're hearing people talking about, this has changed my life. I've got a whole new way of looking at my life. I now realize I don't have to be those things I thought I was. So we had our paper, a paper on the first four patients published in the BMJ um, a couple months ago, which was just looking at the first four. We've now got 15 people in. We measure their blood pressure and temperature and pulse every half hour for the first two hours and then hourly thereafter, and you get this very moderate rise and then fall, so it's very physiologically tolerated. Ridiculous that we have to do this. You know, do you think those 750,000 kids on dance floors are having to measure their temperature every half hour? It's nuts. <laughs> but we have to do it. Um, so, what a lot of people say, hey man, what about Black Monday or Blue Tuesday or Suicide Wednesday or whatever ravers are calling it these days? What about that post-MDMA affect drop? What about the depression? We don't see it. It doesn't seem to occur. Um, anything below zero, anything in the minus figures, is positive mood. Anything above zero is negative mood. Not only do they not get depressed, they are actually in a positively felt mood. We get a weeks-long afterglow effect, like classic psychedelics. And if you think about it, the way... This is, again, why we can't make inferences about MDMA based on ravers. I mean, how do people take to MDMA? They go to the pub, drink three pints, go to a club, take a pill at midnight, another three pints, another pill at two o'clock, another pill at four o'clock, line of cocaine, go back to someone's house, drink a bottle of wine, loads of spliffs, another few lines of cocaine, bit of amphetamine. Maybe Sunday night they get their head down for about an hour and drink a cup of soup. Then they go into work on Monday, and they go, oh man, serotonin depletion. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a hangover, you know? When we have our patients come into us, they've had a good night's sleep, they come in, they've fasted, they take MDMA at nine in the morning, they're up all day, they're back down to baseline by five or six, they sleep beautifully, they eat, they don't miss out on sleep, they're not dancing around, they don't get this. It's an artifact of raving. So we look at loads of other measures as well. Um, this is a very uninteresting slide intentionally because forgetting the efficacy bit over here, basically everyone likes it and it's tolerated and there's no physiological problems. We've got 15 people in so far. Now, these are the outcomes. Now, we cannot make inferences about efficacy because it is not a placebo-controlled trial. It might not be the MDMA at all. It might just be the wonderful therapists. But if you look at these efficacy outcomes so far, in this column here, out of the 13 or so that have um, had MDMA, nine are not drinking at all, and two have returned to previous drinking levels. That's kind of a reverse of the observational study. This is an interesting column as well, though, because what we've got here is about half people have had a drink or two, but not returned to full levels of drinking. That's a really interesting statistic there, because most treatments for alcoholism and most addictions are very binary. You're either on the wagon or you're off. If you're drinking a bottle of vodka a day and you fall off the wagon, if you get dry and then you fall off the wagon, you tend to go back to a bottle of vodka a day or a bottle and a half. There's not that many people that can come back to moderate drinking. And indeed, most of the addiction treatments are based around that. AA, the fellowship, you know, never touch alcohol again, be terrified of it. You know, it is a poison. It would be fascinating if it turns out that MDMA-assisted psychotherapy allows you to return to moderate drinking. So we're not sure. The numbers are small, but it's worth looking at. So um, most of the work for MDMA has been on trauma. Most of the work with psilocybin has been on addictions or um, anxiety-based disorders, particularly end-of-life disorders, stuff with ketamine and depression, ibocaine, ayahuasca, lots of stuff going on in the clinical psychedelic world. It's a really, really exciting place to work. It's been a great privilege that for the last 10, 15 years, I've worked on all of these different studies. I have been 
injecting people with these drugs or receiving them myself. I've received intravenous LSD, psilocybin and ketamine and DMT and MDMA as part of the tra training and I'm still okay. It's a fascinating area in which to work and I encourage people to get involved in psychedelic medicine. Far, far too many boring white middle class men we need to change that. We need greater diversity in all fields, but even in psychedelics. Um, now, what a lot of young people will say, this is Michael Mithofer, the pioneer of MDMA therapy in the States. A lot of young people write to me or come up to me and they say, I really want to do this, but I spoke to my tutor and they said, you're crazy, this is career suicide. Why do you want to do this? And that's what people said to me in Oxford 15 years ago. Ben, why are you aligning yourself with those crazy hippies? Why don't you study something nice and wholesome like SSRIs? It'll destroy your career. Far from it. Far from it destroying my career. It's, this is not some crazy fringe subject, okay? This is cutting edge medicine. And if young people in the audience are thinking about this, but they're cautious, and your tutors have said that to you, all you say to your tutors, open your journals and read about your subject. Not a month goes by that psychedelic medicine is not represented in high-impact journals. Major neuroscientific institutions around the world are running psychedelic therapy programs. This is not just a bunch of weirdos in California. This is cutting-edge psychiatry, cutting-edge neuroscience. We owe it to that population of patients who are being failed by maintenance drug treatments. We owe it to the failing profession to drag itself out of this learned, helpless, palliative care model that we've given ourselves. And we owe it to this little girl. Thank you. <laughs>